Hey guys, this is Nomi Key Const. You are watching The Nomi Key Show. We are a new show and we rely on the generous uh, giving by our viewers. So if you could go to patreon.com slash The Nomi Key Show, you'll be able to see more specials, earlier segments. Uh, you might even get some swag, some special takes from interviews. Uh, we are gonna be putting all of our shows up on Patreon first. Uh, before YouTube, and also you can subscribe to our YouTube page. We are brand new. We are just over a week old. Uh, but today we are doing a special. I am not in studio, as you can see. Uh, but you know the the importance of talking about this cannot be overestimated. We are talking about what happened at the Iowa caucus. The Iowa caucus, as of right now, is has not. They have not declared the results. And part of the reason they have not declared the result, I would say, all of the reason is because of a malfunction with an application that was used uh, by the party, the Iowa Democratic Party. Earlier today, we saw spin coming out of, of the establishment wing of the Democratic Party in which they immediately cast blame on Bernie Sanders, stating that he was trying to reform the, the, the caucuses and this is what you get. And then they started to spin saying the Unity Reform Commission was trying to eliminate primaries and replace them with caucuses. I am saying this to you as a member of the Unity Reform Commission. That is 100% certifiably, verifiably false. And that is coming from the Center for American Progress and Neera Tandon. This happened during the Unity Reform Commission, which as a reminder to those of you who do not know, the Unity Reform Commission was a 21 member commission that formed after the 2016 flawed primary process. And it was made up of a majority of Hillary supporters, three Tom Perez appointments, and eight Bernie Sanders appointments. We were tasked with reforming the primary process, the caucus process, and the Democratic Party and the superdelegate system. Now, just to make this extremely clear, and please reiterate this online, we, as a commission, only issued recommendations. We had no ability to vote to enact these recommendations. And furthermore, it is up to states, based on state law, to determine whether or not they are a caucus state or a primary state. Nobody, not even Chairman Perez himself, has the power to decide whether a state is a caucus or a primary, and some are both. All we could do is say, this is how a caucus can get better. And that was something that was unanimous on the commission. Might I remind you that Hillary Clinton won the Iowa caucus and the Nevada caucus, that her staff, her staff was actually passionate about the caucus system. There are a lot of people, former Obama people that were on the commission that had a lot of positive things to say about the caucus system. There are pros and cons to both systems. I'm not gonna go back and, and hash it out, but I want you to know that uh, we did all we could to make sure that caucuses were more accessible but the enact, enacting those reforms was on the Democratic National Committee. And that's where I'm gonna to get to this next point. Uh, nobody, you know, let's, let's kill it right now. The caucuses are decided by the states. All they could do is try to make the caucuses better. But the app, the application is the fault here. And really what happened in the, the Unity Reform Commission was we had a very, very, party debate over the budget of the party. The budget of the party has not been transparent. Uh, you may recall I, I was speaking on the last meeting of the Unity Reform Commission on C-SPAN. It was a little bit of a viral clip because I dropped an F-bomb in which I was talking about the budget of the Democratic Party being transparent and people being held accountable for the 2016 election. Because the Democratic Party and presidential elections who were working together, the Hillary campaign in particular, and some super PACs, uh, they were working together, raising money from small don donors to large donors. And the money was essentially being funneled into a handful of contractors. Uh, they, they had contracts with the Democratic Party and the institutions that work with it. Uh, so it's, it's definitely a pay-to-play system. Uh, it's, it's handing out contracts to cronies. But what we were trying to do was have budget oversight and accountability and to be able to preemptively have bidding in it for contracts and examine whether or not a contract is worth bidding on. You know, these are very large contracts, but even more so, uh, we try to ban conflicts of interest in the party. And this was my personal issue. I wrote that little uh, resolution that 
uh, ended up being erased, mysteriously erased, when our recommendations went to the Rules Committee. Now, the Rules Committee of the Democratic Party was entirely appointed by Chairman Perez. And the Rules Committee decided which reforms were to be enacted and how they, were be, they would be enacted. The Rules Committee, uh, I learned as of today, was in charge of, of agreeing to these contracts. So this app, which we'll get to in a second, went through minimal process in which Chairman Perez, his appointees, who were not elected to the DNC, his appointees approved in a, in a quick you know, very quick approval process of this contract, this app contract. And state parties and state party chairs were questioning whether or not this app would work. I now know this on a good authority. I've interviewed DNC members. Uh, and they are saying that they ask questions. Uh, you know, there's even reporting that as of last week, this, this came out today, um, that as of last week, this is in Washington Post, uh, people in Iowa, officials in Iowa, were complaining that the app was malfunctioning, it wasn't working, and that the, the, the party, the, the Iowa party, was not responding. And furthermore, the chair, the Democratic National Committee chair, was not responding. Now, let's talk about the app. Early reports said that this app was uh, attributed to Robbie Mook, the former campaign manager of Hillary Clinton. It uh, turns out that's false. He is involved in technology companies, and there was reporting from the New York Times, Washington Post, uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, that I, I, I guess had confused this process. And, and let me just reiterate that most reporters really don't understand how the DNC works. Um, I, I can't believe how much I've read today that is just false. Even people who, who, who cover the Unity Reform Commission attributed these reforms to, to Bernie Sanders. That, that's just false. The reforms were coming from everyone. Th th these, these meetings were taped. So if you really want to sit down and watch like 40 hours of footage, feel free to. <laughs> you can find those clips. Um, but this app that was used, uh, it has become immediately controversial because of who runs the app, uh, who, who, is, is, who the clients of the app company are, and how the app is structured. And so we have Samuel Finkelstein, Sam, uh, who is our follow the money expert who has rushed to a camera to sit down with us and, and tell us a little bit about what this app is. So Sam, um, what's the name of the app? Uh, and how, how is it structured? Let's just start off with that. The name of the app is, well, the name of the company rather that uh, manufactured the app is Shadow Incorporated, which is almost like two on the nose, yes. given the scenario that we now find ourselves in. But Shadow, on their website, they're extremely opaque as to who works there. They just give a vague description of being staffed by veterans of Hillary for America, Obama for America, Google, Apple, uh, but no, no specific names. Mm -hmm. Some uh, Twitter sleuths that were investigating this found a bunch of LinkedIn profiles for people who were executives at um, Shadow, and it confirmed that almost all of them were veterans of Hillary 2016. That seems to be the the thread that in their, LinkedIn's, in their LinkedIn's just just to break this down so we can verify it. They basically reverse engineered and went to LinkedIn to see who worked for the company and then found the CEOs and the people running the company. Exactly. Yeah. The, the company's website doesn't list who the CEO is, but the CEO's LinkedIn says right. he's the CEO. So you know, kind of just backtrack that way. Um, but Shadow, the reason why their name is Shadow, in in their words. Uh, they they describe themselves as uh, wanting to to be like the shadow technical infrastructure of the Democratic Party and the progressive movement and wherever I'm not making this up wherever there's light there's always a shadow so basically they're selling themselves as wanting to uh, be the infrastructure of uh, the left right broad left. So they, they, they started, Shadow is the company, but there is a, a parent company. Can you explain what this parent company is? Yes. Shadow is a, an appendage of a, a larger group that's called Acronym, which... <laughs> they couldn't is, think of an acronym, so they just called it Acronym. <laughs> exactly. Uh, strange word choice. But Acronym also funds... Um, 
acronym is, is funded by mostly just you know billionaires, the kind of people who underwrite centrist democratic politics. And acronym also funds a digital strategy firm that according to the FEC has never had a client, um, which is odd. <laughs> It was, it's called Lockwood Strategy. So if anyone wants to look into that, I encourage you to. Um, they also have a super PAC called Pacronym. I'm not making this up. Uh, so we can get into that also. And and you know, Shadow is a company that they founded. Now this morning, Acronym obviously was getting tons of uh, requests for comment from reporters. And they distanced themselves completely. They, they tried to make it out as though it's an arm's length relationship. All we did was seed the money and let the company be. How true that is, I have no idea. But yeah, I mean, we, it was interesting because uh, on MSNBC last night, I was I, so I cover, I was on uh, the Majority Report last night, and Sam Cedar ran out of the studio <laughs> and rushed over to MSNBC to do a late night uh, segment with Chris Hayes and. On the panel, I don't know how Sam didn't punch him in the face, frankly. David Plouffe. Joke, exactly. David Plouffe. Uh, for, for those Obama veterans like myself, you know, Plouffe, not Plouffe, Mook, not, not Mook. <laughs> you got to get him right. Um, so David Plouffe was on the panel, and he uh, was distancing himself. As much as possible. Board. As much as possible. He's on the board of this company, Acronym, right? Yes, he's on the board of the company, but he's a, he's a volunteer, and he described the company in an extremely bizarre way as being primarily a newsletter company. And, and to be clear, they do own a media outlet that seems fairly marginal. I've never heard of them. It's a, I think it's Courier and Post. Um, but... They do own a media outlet, but it's not a new acronym is not a newsletter company. You know, they're they 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 created a company that is now ruining the Iowa caucus. So they, it's not a newsletter company. Well, I don't let's, let's let's like remind everybody who David Plouffe is. He was uh, the campaign manager for for Barack Obama, and he uh, manager correct? Yes. A second time around, yeah. Um, and he. He ended up going to work as a lobbyist for Uber. If you recall the 2016 convention in Philadelphia, for those of you who weren't there, uh, the convention was pretty far away from downtown. It was very hard to get to. The subway system was probably the most effective way, but uh, it was very difficult for people to park, uh, for people to walk into the convention. And so, oh, how special it was that Uber was the main sponsor. And so there were these huge tents outside, these Uber tents that were like set up like spas. And... Uh, you'd have to wait there for some cases hours for your Uber to, to arrive. It was it was the way you got around in in Philadelphia, and of course that's a huge contract, huge contract for a company. And and many former Obama people went on to go to Uber. But I I, I digress. I just think it's a really great example of uh, of of the crony, you know, just how how this is such a incestuous. It's it's. It's become a cesspool for legalized corruption and patting each other's backs. Uh, and really, re in the case of Hillary Clinton um, and her campaign, people around her rewarding people who just do not have any interest in winning elections. It's becoming very clear. And just while we're on the subject of David Plouffe and Uber, his big thing was promoting Uber in, in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, which you know, why not just mix those two things together? Was he against uh, women driving and this was like their their solution? It was. <laughs> I don't... I get that. So I mean, do you remember where I, my was mind went? You know, it was, that was the progressive solution. You know, women can just get shuttled around. Um, so there's that. Oh, and awesome. you can confirm all of this on Uber's Twitter account uh, if you don't want to take my word for it. But um, so back back to acronym. So acronym acronym is is structured. It's a it's a for profit company. It funds a super PAC that doesn't seem to do anything, and it, it funds a news entity and this app. It's it's not an investment firm. So is it is it really just like a, a is it possibly like a front group? I mean, how is this? What's going on here? Are people making money, or are they using it as a tool for disruption, or all of the above? I. I want to stick to what I can, you know, rather than speculate and get into the conspiracy theories, uh, <laughs> I don't know if they're intentionally, it, just in the context of Shadow, I don't know if they're intentionally 
being disruptive, mm -hmm. but they're being very disruptive. As you said at the beginning of the segment, we have no idea what happened at the Iowa caucus, and it's specifically because of this app. And it's really incredible if you think about it. This company that we know has been seeded with millions of dollars from billionaires was unable to come up. Like it had one job, yeah. which was report the votes, let people log in and report. The, like this is a very this, simple app. It's not complicated at all. Like I know people who are 15 who could probably program something like that if you gave them enough time. And this was also never number. tested at scale. Right. So that's that's the other thing. You know, we're talking about a, a state that has, you know, 3.18 million people, not counting all of them. That I mean, how many voted? We don't know. But let's say three quarters, if we're being extremely generous, turned out and voted, which is extremely generous. We're expect, we, they were expecting 200,000. Yes, exactly. We're, it's a, a couple hundred thousand is. But I'm just saying this mm -hmm. is what you have to do for crazy situations. Right. Um, you know, it's a pretty. Pretty much all primaries and caucuses are low turnout for the most part. They're they're usually somewhere between you know twelve to to twenty five percent if you're if you're lucky. So this is this is a perfectly doable app, and we had signals from from people on the ground saying it didn't work in the lead up. And I think this is something I just want to reiterate over and over. Why was this app contract rewarded? It's a very large contract for a very simple task. And, 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 and really, I think the other aspect is, why were these people running it? Like, do they have the background to run this? Do they have the expertise to run it? You know, you, you, you told me ahead of time, um, there were some organizing directors and people on Hillary's team. Can we talk a little bit about who's part of the actual app team? Yes, so the, the people on the team, they ostensibly, some of them do have like engineering backgrounds or soft, you know, back end software backgrounds, uh, specifically in the context of Hillary 2016. Um, but again, this is very this is very limited information. I only know about a handful of people on the board there. And we don't know how big this company is. Obviously, this is not an, something that they've ever done before. This is a, a, a dry run for them. And again, it was never tested at scale. So there were the early reports trickling in, like you said, about you know Iowa field directors calling the de calling the Democratic Party and being like, "Hey, like we can't log in. This isn't working." Uh, like days before, weeks before, and those were essentially ignored. Um, I don't, I don't think that they had the capacity to deal with this. I guess if we're you know giving them a generous read that they're not bad actors, then they're just incompetent. Right. Well, is, this is the famous team that uh, relied on data in 2016, yeah. and and you know data couldn't couldn't alert them that Wisconsin might be an important state to focus on. Um, I, I do have it on good authority from uh, a few DNC members that quote they forced Iowa to use the app and approve their plan very late. They didn't listen to the state parties. Unquote. So. Um, and, and they meaning Tom Perez, because Tom Perez and his rules committee, those are his people. And let's remind everybody that the rules committee is made up of, of people who, a good chunk of the people who are making money off of the status quo of the party, the way that the party is structured. They're the ones who are against having budget oversight. They're the ones who water down our reforms that called for any oversight and accountability. So when you hear people on cable news spinning that this is because Bernie Sanders wanted to reform the caucuses, no, 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 let's be very clear. It's because Bernie Sanders wanted to have accountability and oversight in the party and they refused to. It's how a contract was re rewarded to, to friends and family or whatever, uh, cronies, of, of the people who, who brought us, you know, Donald Trump, who failed to, to see the obvious on a map. So this is nothing to do, the caucuses themselves, you know, we really don't even know the turnout. So I, I think that's, that's, a, that's something the press isn't doing well right now either. We don't know the turnout, but the caucuses themselves, even if it was lower turnout than expected, they still functioned. People still got to the polls. They had satellite caucuses for the first time ever. And that was a product of reforms from the commission and, and that were taken into account. But this app, which dictated the number of people, which is something so that you can see whether or not there are shenanigans on the ground, it malfunctioned. And of course, uh, each, each campaign had their own version of the numbers. And so uh, there is that. But, um, you know, I, I want to go back to, to some of the conflicts here because 
you know, going back to acronym, um, you 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 pointed out a funder uh, named Seth Claremont. Is that his name? A hedge fund billionaire? We'll go with that. Seth Claremont. Uh, yes, he's a hedge fund billionaire. And up until very recently, he was a Republican donor. He he funded, you know, your corporate Marco Rubio type Republicans. And it was only when Donald Trump suggested that we should forgive Puerto Rico's debt that he flipped and started funding corporate Democrats that opposed forgiving Puerto Rico's debt. And the reason he would do that is because he owns $911 million of that debt. So he's obviously got a pretty big stake in that money getting to him. Um, and, and yeah, so he is the biggest funder, this is according to uh, Max Blumenthal at the Gray Zone, um, he's the biggest funder of Pacronym. Uh, so he's seeded them with millions of dollars and he's seeded, you know, acronym with an unknown amount of money. Um, but yeah, he's a big hedge fund guy and he's also extremely involved in the far right pro Israel pro settlement lobby in America. So, okay. Uh, just, just to touch on, on Puerto Rico, because it's funny. It's like all you look back at your life and like, how did I end up doing all these things that all mm -hmm. It, you know, unite. But um, I covered the 2017 shares election, and I also covered Puerto Rico and uh, the storm. And what I ended up learning very quickly on the ground uh, in Puerto Rico, because politics is very complicated, is that statehood is actually a right wing issue. It is not a democratic issue, uh, meaning Democratic Party. And of course, uh, th there's really no Democratic versus Republican Party in in um, Puerto Rico. It's much more complicated. Uh, but there are people who identify as Democrats on the mainland, meaning here. And at the end of the day, there was a lobby by the conservative members in Puerto Rico, many of whom are these hedge funders who own debt, uh, to push for statehood status uh, in the Democratic Party because there's a financial aspect attached to that. And so when Tom Perez was lobbying his votes, it is, I think it's safe to say at this point that the Puerto Rican, de Puerto Rican delegation of the DNC uh, swung the votes for Tom Perez. And you can see, you know, you can go back and look at uh, photos of, at the time, the governor, Rosselló, who <laughs> has been ousted um, due to protests on the streets in Puerto Rico. Uh, he, you know, he, he tried to privatize the entire country, essentially. And he was meeting with Tom Perez, uh, lobbying uh, for, for statehood. Um, you look at some of the members on the DNC, including the Rules Committee, by the way, and you have folks who are consultants and, and and in, in, involved in representing the hedge funds, the hedge funders uh, that are owning the Puerto Rican debt. This is a massive amount of money, by the way. It's almost a billion dollars per person. It's, it's crazy. We're not talking small time money. This is a place where there's taxation without representation on the island. Um, people are getting taxed on, you know, for imports and exports and people are being forced off of their land. And of course, uh, there's a whole real estate aspect of this for, for billionaires. So it is important to mention Puerto Rico because that actually aids to the structure of the DNC. And I will do a completely different segment on that. If you want to know more, I can name the names. It is, um, it's jarring, but, uh, Israel is a big part of this. We have the Israel lobby in, in, in the DNC and the Puerto Rican lobby, which never gets enough attention and is confusing for a lot of folks, let alone just people who don't understand the DNC. So, um, all right, so these are some of the people. Uh, what else did you learn from your, your findings? So one thing that I noticed last night that was definitely extraordinarily sketchy and kind of ties this all together is I, I, I went to Shadow's uh, Twitter account, it's like at Shadow Incorporated or at Shadow Inc. And it's a relatively inactive account. They follow 79 other people. And of those 79, one of them happens to be a dark money group called Democratic Majority for Israel, which is the same group that launched those attack ads on Bernie Sanders in Iowa like a week ago. $700,000, oh, right? $700,000 worth of attack ads, exactly. Uh, saying, that, oh, Bernie's too old. He had a heart attack. He can't beat Donald Trump. So it's just really odd that you know, these groups would be uh, connected, e even just following one another on Twitter, because they're both totally unknown to the public until just now. And apparently they know each other. Um, and then we find out that one of the uh, 
Uh, and when I say that uh, that guy, Seth Klarman, is a big like pro-Israel guy, I mean like he's he f- is the primary funder of a bunch of these yeah. sort of organizations like Democratic Majority for Israel. I don't know about that one specifically, but I know that he funds lots of groups that are just like that one in America. So it's really strange to see uh, that connection. Um, he owns the Times of Israel, too. He owns the Times of Israel, exactly, which at one point published an op-ed that it later had to uh, apologize for and, and scrub from the internet, which is which was titled like when genocide is okay in reference to like the Palestinian conflict. So these are not, uh, these are not good people. Yeah. Um, so this leads to, to the next part, which is, uh, hate to bury the lead here guys, but he's also a maxed out donor to Pete Buttigieg. And sure um, is. <laughs> I found it fascinating, um, yesterday as, as this information was coming in that, uh, you know, Pete Buttigieg also uses this app, but to be fair, there were other candidates who use this app too. Um, I think again, this is a conflict of interest and this is something that we tried to ban on the Democratic Party because we knew the conflicts of interest are cesspools for this type of, of situation. Not only is this firm, just as a side note, you know, not, uh, it's, it's, it's a for-profit political company. You know, political, Robbie Mook, funny, funny enough, was on CBS this morning talking about how uh, party operatives need to be out of the business of <laughs> primaries and caucuses, and it really should be left to states. Well, you know, th- I-, I won't say if that's true or not at this point, but uh, when you have operatives handing out projects to their friends, operatives also mingle in circles of, of, of campaigns as well. It's not just state parties, but campaigns. So Pete Buttigieg uh, uses this app. Uh, tell us a little bit about, th- about that. Well, so... You said that other campaigns have paid this company, and that's true, but Pete's paid almost double what the next campaign, which happens to be Kirsten Gillibrand, oddly enough, uh, paid. So Pete paid $42,500 for software and uh, um, subscription services. According to them, it's for uh, texting stuff, but you know who knows? Uh, the Biden campaign has also paid them. The Iowa Democratic Party paid them sixty thousand dollars. Forced, uh, forced by the DNC. Yes, the Nevada Democratic Party paid the same amount, and you know, <laughs> we'll cross that bridge when we get there, I guess. Um, the Wisconsin Democratic Party paid them a, a smaller amount, like four grand. Um, and yeah, so. You talk about conflicts of interest with specifically regard to to Pete Buttigieg. We know that one of his top strategists is married to one of the higher ups at Shadow, which is really interesting. There was a tweet last night, you know, and I think people say, oh, but that's, you know, you can't guilt somebody for being married to someone. At the end of the day, your financial interests are aligned, and and and, and there's a reason why corporate governance and and journalists used to work this way. Where you, and, and if you work for the government, you have to disclose your relationships. If you run for office in some sense, I mean, when I ran for office here, you have to disclose your relationships with people because of that. And so, um, it's it's when you're in the business of elections, okay, it, it, you got to be able to disclose these things ahead of time. But there was a tweet that went out. Was it from from one of the one of the ranking, I don't know if she was a CEO, COO, what was she? Well, she was cheering Pete Buttigieg running in the race. And she's... She, she's posted multiple tweets that are very enthusiastic pro Pete tweets. Who was this, though? This was the... I have to find her. <laughs> but in the meantime, I mean, it, it, it's... There's just so much information coming out here. And we're just giving you a recap that the, the top, you know, the top issues that came up. Uh, the top conflicts, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, they're doing this out in the open, and I don't think that they're used to being called out. So what do we do moving forward? Uh, I think it really is going to come down to uh, the the muscle from Bernie's campaign. Um, I personally don't see much of a path to victory for, for Pete Buttigieg, especially once he starts going to states like South Carolina and Nevada, but I think that the party is doing all they can to suppress any movement 